So tonight we talk about hindrances. But before we begin, I have a quiz for you to see if you are doing well in your metta practice. Okay. There were these seven monks living in a cave in a remote jungle. Uh, they were practicing good meditation. But unfortunately, these bandits found them. And they wanted to occupy this cave. And among these seven monks, there was the abbot, he was the chief monk. There was his best friend. Um, and uh, his enemy monk, that can happen. <laughs> um, and really sick monk, really old monk, um, and a useless monk. <laughs> he did not contribute to this uh, monastery um, and a uh, visiting monk. So bandits, because they want to occupy this cave uh, and hide whatever they have stolen inside the cave, <coughs> said, we have to kill all of you. Otherwise, you will report us to authorities. Um, and the chief monk came forward and said, please don't do that. We will not tell anyone. Uh, please let us go. No matter how many times he tried, the bandits were not taking it. So finally, because the chief monk was not giving up, the bandit said, we will kill one of you and the rest can go, but if any one of you report us to authorities, we will come and kill the, the remaining six of you. So which one do you think <laughs> he picked? <laughs> he said the right to pick the chief monk to pick? Yeah. Chief monk had to pick. He was the one bargaining. Himself? <laughs> yeah, himself is too much metta, so that's a, yeah. Any other responses? Sorry? The useless monk. The useless monk. <laughs> yeah, I can see why. <laughs> no one? That is also an answer. Any other responses? <coughs> hmm? Visiting monk. Yeah, he didn't know anything and now he's in this situation. So why not the really old monk or really um, sick monk? They're going to die anyway. No? So, actually, with loving kindness, you cannot pick anyone. You cannot pick yourself because your loving kindness includes you. So, no one is the answer. So, you helped everybody to pass the <laughs> quiz. <laughs> good, good meditation. Bandits, <laughs> bandits, yes. I always bandits. forget to tell that part. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. um, so the rest of the story is that bandits learned loving kindness and they were so moved and they became monks. <laughs> good, good. Yeah, extra points. <laughs> so um, now to hindrances. Suppose you are, you know, taking a walk and you see five venomous snakes, what do you do? 
yes don't step on them you just you know you are watching where they are you don't disturb them you don't dwell thinking too much about them you just safely go because you are slowly progressing in this journey so hindrances are these obstacles that come in the way in your mental purity process can you guess what they are yes yeah yeah hatred is like aversion so sensual desire you know sounds familiar right when the moment you try to meditate food comes to your mind or images and past memories come to your mind many things come to your mind so you can pack all these you know we are all living in this realm called sensual realm so we are supposed to get them there is nothing wrong with having these thoughts this is our way we are human beings um, or if you are a heavenly being you will anyway get these one of these hindrances so sensual desire especially can bother you when you really start to watch your mind because you are now giving attention to your mind these things are there in your mind so you want that ice cream that you had maybe 5 years ago because things that happened in the mind can come to life like it's fresh like it happened yesterday that is how powerful this mind is and the other hindrance is ill will like i don't like this kind you know i hate this person i hate this noise i hate this practice i hate this thought you know all that frustration builds up and you no know, not wanting things well the buddha said in his first sermon not getting what you want is a kind of suffering so this wanting can create some kind of uh, frustration you know i ordained this monk in uh, cambridge and he was learning to put his robe on and he was so frustrated with this he just dropped the robe <laughs> and then he uh, told me what had happened and i told him you know this is this shows where your attachments are just treat the hindrance just treat treat this frustration as venerable frustration i think i mentioned that yesterday um these are so important these snakes that you see they are important they contribute to your ecosystem they they have so much wisdom but we have to learn the way to handle these precious uh beings so the other uh, hindrance or obstacle to your path is um sloth and torpor this happens when you eat too much or eat little or you work too hard or you haven't slept enough um you are worried about something um there's some lack of energy lack of joy happening and you are now sleepy so um when that happens you feel like giving up meditating you know, this practice you know, i'm bored that happens um when that happens it's good you just observe it recognize release relax and return return to your spiritual friend so you continuously you know you try to be consistent with bringing this effort if you can't do that you go take a nap that is loving kindness your body is asking you to rest to it's us it's you listen to this message from your body <coughs> and you don't have to feel feel bad about taking a nap in the middle of the day um so you can do that here but if you are really 
musically snoring, you may choose to go into your cabin and take a nap there. But you have to be mindful about this nap. Because you may want to indulge in it. Um, like little more and no soon you realize four hours gone and that those four hours was for you to actually get up and move and meditate. So please uh, maybe find a way to maybe program your mind so you wake up in 20 minutes like a power nap. Just what you need. But if you go a little over it's okay you know you can always start again and start over and you will be back on track, back on the path. Now um, the other obstacle is restlessness. You feel restless because of many things. Um, you feel restless because of thinking about something. You miss someone. Um, you want to uh, complain about something. Uh, or this important question about the universe, you know, what's the end of the universe comes to your mind and um, you become you know, full of thoughts, proliferating you know, stuff. You are just restless. You know, so you, uh, this can happen. This is one of the obstacles and you recognize this. Recognize it. Release it from your attention. Uh, relax and return to your spiritual friend. If the you know restlessness is caused by wanting to complain about something, you can tell yourself you know uh, some wisdom quote: um, "He who blame others have a long way to go. He who blames." oneself is halfway there. He who blames no one has arrived. So just a little bit of wisdom quote just to drop that restlessness and move on. If it starts to bother you, find one of us and you know, uh, talk to us. So you just move, move on and it, it doesn't it doesn't become a huge barrier for your progress. And the, the last one, last hindrance is doubting. You know, what am I doing uh, here in this Dharma Sukha Center? Why did I not go um, to Hawaii to <laughs> um, have some ice cream and stay in the beach and enjoy this long vacation or you know, all these, you know, Doubting brings a lot of thinking to your, you know, you question the Eightfold Path, you question why monks are choosing to live this way, and you question, and what happens next, you know, um, what is my future life is going to be. Uh, you doubt about um, Buddha, you doubt about his teachings. Um, so this can happen. When that happens, please um, don't have to feed it. Let it be. Allow it to be. Six are it. And um, if you have any of these um, obstacles, you know, including having doubts, you can always, you know, ask questions and reason out through these questions, you know, and understand through engaging in Dhamma discussions, which is quite possible here. We do these Dhamma discussions every day to give you a little bit of feel to carry on the practice. Okay. Um, there is a sutta called Dubbanya Sutta. Dubbanya is like ugly colors um, and in that you find uh, uh, a yakka. Yakka is this uh, demon. He, he, he's, he's ugly, according to the story. Um, he wants to occupy the seat of the k 
king, ruler of heavens. So he goes and he does not listen to the security guards there. He goes and sit in that heavenly throne. And no matter how many times the security guards tried to pull, pull him away, um, they didn't, he didn't listen. They couldn't uh, stop him. And they started insulting him. And the more they insulted him, he started getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Now he is full of this hole. And the leader of heaven was away doing some business and he came back and he learned that this person was visiting and was seated in his royal throne. He was happy to have a visitor. He went in front of this um, yakka and joined his palms together and put one knee down to respect him and said, can I offer you a cup of coffee, cappuccino, chai latte, green tea? Or so he just allowed him to, he welcomed him. And the more love and kindness he received, smaller and smaller he became. And ultimately, he couldn't stay there. He disappeared. So with hindrances, we always have to make sure that we treat them with loving kindness. That way you don't feed them. You don't make them bigger. No nut nutriments are given. There's no need to. No need to feed them. No need to dwell in on them too long. And you will no soon realize this too shall pass. Impermanence. And you are free. So trust the Dhamma, trust the wheel that it will take you uh, in the right direction. Um, so I mentioned craving yesterday. Do you remember what craving is? Wanting things to be than they are. Yeah, wanting things to be different than they are. Bantevi used to say craving simply is I like it or I don't like it mind. So with craving, there is a teaching that he used to bring up always. This teaching is called dependent origination, how craving arises dependent on other conditions. This is a main teaching that the Buddha revealed to the world, having examined it himself, having discovered it, and he taught how suffering arises dependently and how it also ceases. It, it doesn't, when you observe closely, you can understand that suffering is, it just arises and vanishes. So to gain that wisdom, you need to look at how, how the process works. We give a talk on dependent origination on uh, the fifth day of the retreat based on the Buddha's teachings. This will be very, very useful to you and it will be life-changing um, when you start to learn this, this, this discourse. I have uh, sensed, uh, this was when I studied in the university, there was this doctor family. Every time I reflected dependent origination on the bus going to the university, they brought me dana. And I was wondering, what is the connection here? And I never contacted them. They brought me, they, they, they would say, we will bring uh, your food today to the university. I believe it's such a huge teaching. When someone reflects on it, the whole universe rejoices it because it's so rare, so profound, so deep. And the Buddha said, um, one who sees dependent origination sees the Buddha. So if you want to see the Buddha, pay close attention to this word every time you hear it. See how the process works. So um, this is the basic teaching. You can 
um, read sutras like Madhupindika Sutta where the Buddha describes this teaching and other sutras like Majjhimanikaya 38 uh, we will we will explore this together um, now we have this physical eye and you see all the colors outside but um, we need to be conscious on these things and meeting of these three together eye the colors or forms and consciousness there is a contact made otherwise you can stare at me and be listening to something but you have not made a contact directly so so this process happens and it disappears it happens disappears with your eye ear nose tongue the whole process, whole body dharma is here and now there is a another thing that mani is manifested with this process with the contact there is a feeling often you can notice pleasant feelings painful feelings but because of ignorance we don't notice neutral feelings some most things that we experience we are neutral about them but these three feelings arise see things dependently arising we we can't see it because we don't think like this an ordinary person if they have never heard this um, they they will not come to this uh, truth the buddha said um, for right view to arise two things are important one is hearing the dhamma from someone someone's voice and spiritual companionship all these people uh, practicing so now you hear it um in that feeling process you can see with pleasant feelings you want more of it with painful feelings you push them away now that is craving not knowing neutral feelings that is ignorance so craving and ignorance work together um that that is a huge link not knowing all these things is a huge link and very important now you are slowly knowing this process now with craving there is more needed in you know in your mind mindset and that is called clinging grasping upadan clinging close closely grabbing to it and with clinging you take you make you know emotional actions and reactions and there is birth of action in the sensual realm we often make um unwise actions unwise choices that always pull us toward this sensual realm habits and we when we notice it um we kind of sense a, some liberation here some freedom to most things that you cling to uh, or that most things that you don't want in life there is a strong craving there most of us are blinded by the the things that we see things that we hear and we because of this blindness we get attached to suffering and we don't even realize that 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 is happening to us now clinging happened and birth of action happened and um when there is continued wanting and continued processes of arising happens and this takes us in a cycle of birth and death birth and death without us realizing we abandon the physical body with the death of the physical body but the process seems to continue until we untangle this and we can't say stop it it won't stop we need to clearly see all these links and this is why Uh, we meditate we can't just wish that it'll be done to us it doesn't happen that way so we need to investigate the process 
and to in order to investigate the process we need to be free from these hindrances always remember that it is a process the whole mass of suffering arises like this and you can now see the cessation of it also with the cessation of one thing other things continue to cease especially if you notice that if you did not cling it's it breaks there if you did not um, crave it stops there so we eliminate some cravings but it's not easy we eliminate can we eliminate feelings we it's not possible they arise but you can always change the pers perspective perspective about these um, these phenomena and also see the impersonality nature of this that it's not you doing it it just happens and that is how wisdom slowly slowly arises in in you there's the path is there is no traveler nibbana is there is no one enters into it so why worry but for us to see it we need to take the practice sincerely seriously and not worry about um other things like am i going to be um forgotten by my friends am i going so you you will see that you your sense of humor changes you are joyful and like i said the personality start to change and you start to see the world very very di- differently and you start to like yourself and you choose to cultivate wholesome qualities in in your mind and with that you will notice a kind of blessing that you never experienced before by abandoning hindrances you land in greater happiness in uh, one of the dhammapada verses um, it says so 290 says chaje matta suk matta sukham dhiro sampassang vipulan sukham so a wise person gives up lesser happiness when they see a greater happiness so we notice the hindrances obstacles and we are willing to give up and we will learn from the buddha's teachings um so when you see the process most importantly what happens is that equanimity kicks in with equanimity you see the world with without having to react to everything without having to take everything personally that you have to do something about this you have to do something about that 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 wanting also disappears um we will not be suppressing hindrances in our practice right when you see those snakes you are not digging a hole and burying them you just see the true nature of them their behaviors and and the buddha describes this process in several uh, sutras um this is sanyutta nikaya 4637 the buddha says monks there are these five obstructions hindrances corruptions of the mind weakeners of wisdom what five sensual desire ill will sloth and torpor restlessness and remorse and doubt so restlessness and remorse together uh, in pali they are called kama chanda vyapada tinamidda uddacha kukkucha and vichikicha just one time you just heard it i will not mm-hmm. bring them up again so there are monks these seven factors of enlightenment so instead of cultivating hindrances you can cultivate seven factors of enlightenment so there are things that you can cultivate grow in your mind garden and make it a beautiful place these seven factors of enlightenment which are non obstructions non hindrances non corruptions of the mind 
when developed and cultivated, they lead to the realization of the fruit of true knowledge and liberation. Word 7, the enlightenment factor of mindfulness, investigation of states, mental states, energy, joy, tranquility, concentration and equanimity. Sati, Dhamma Vichaya, Virya, Piti, Pasadhi, Samadhi, Upekha, these seven. Mindfulness, you learned about it yesterday, so it's, it's good to have it, it's good to develop it, it's good to let it grow and increase mindfulness all the time. Um, it's bringing presence to what you do. And the, in Satipatthana Sutta, the four foundations of mindfulness, the Buddha says, how monks does a monk live contemplating mental objects in the mental objects of five of the five hindrances? So four foundations are observing the body, feelings, mind and mind objects. So under this fourth section, mind objects, we have to work on hindrances. And this is how the Buddha teaches that part. Here in monks, when sense desire is present, just the first hindrance, the monk knows there is sense desire in me or when sense desire is not present, he knows there is no sense desire in me. He knows how the arising of the non arisen sense desire comes to be based on dependent origination, the insight. What is not arisen can arise when conditions are present, when you start to feed. This is why. Um, you give all the electronics to the Masuka so you don't have the urge to follow <coughs> the stuff and find out what happened out there, what happened with the election and so on. Let me just see. Go on. <laughs> so he knows how the abandoning of the horizon sense desire comes to be, not dwelling on it, also seeing the cessation phenomena, things arise and pass away, see the links how it happens with um, the internal sense faculties and external um, objects and how the process start and vanish. And he knows how the non-arising in the future of the abandoned sense desire comes to be because you let go of it, because you found greater happiness um, which are called jhanas, levels of understanding, very nice places to be, much stable and nice conditions. When you s experience that, you don't worry about the hindrance. This happens in meditation. So each of the remaining four hindrances are also described in the same way. It's like seeing the snake and seeing that it is there and seeing that it goes back into the jungle and you take the controller away. You don't control the environment where the snake is. You just see that it is there. It gets weakened and it, it, it will disappear. Now, um, there's another teaching. This is from the fruits of the contemplative life. It's called Samanya Phala Sutta Diga Nikaya, Long Discourses of the Buddha, number two. The Buddha says, when these five hindrances are not abandoned in himself, the monk regards it as a debt, a sickness, a prison, slavery, a road through desolate country. But when these five hindrances are abandoned in himself, he regards it as being free from debt having good health, 
being released from prison. Freedom, a place of security. Uh, you know, Rumi comes to my mind. This is about all of us. Um, he says, one of the marvels in the world is to see a prisoner sitting inside the prison with the key in the hand, in his hand. He can escape. We can all escape, but we don't want to. Um, there is this other beautiful sutta. This is also, this is from Sanyutta Nikaya 4655. I will read. Uh, someone comes to see the Buddha and asks this question. Why is it, good Gautama, how does it come about that sometimes sacred words I have long studied are not clear to me, not to mention those I have not studied? And how is it too that sometimes other sacred words that I have not so studied are clear to me? not to mention those I have studied. Well, Brahman, this is the Buddha responding. When a man dwells with his heart possessed and overwhelmed by sense desires and does not know as it really is the way of escape from sense desires that have arisen, then he cannot know or see as it really is, what is it to his own profit? Nor can he know and see what is to the profit of others, of, of both himself and others. Then even sacred words he has long studied are not clear to him, not to mention those he has not studied. The Buddha gives a simile. Imagine, Brahman, a bowl of water mixed with lac, turmeric, dark green or crimson dye. If a man with good eyesight were to look at the reflection of his own face in it, he would not know or see it as it really was. In the same way, Brahman, when a man dwells with his heart possessed and overwhelmed by sense desires, then he cannot know or see, as it really is, what is to his own profit, to the profit of others, to the profit of both. Then even sacred words he has long studied are not clear to him, not to mention those he has not studied. So he goes on discussing about all five hindrances. Again, Brahman, when a man dwells with his heart possessed and overwhelmed with ill will, anger, then he cannot know or see. Imagine a bowl of water heated on a fire, boiling up and bubbling over. This is anger, bubbling over. If a man with good eyesight were to look at the reflection of his own face in it, he would not know or see it as it really was. Again, Brahman, when a man dwells with his heart possessed and overwhelmed by sloth and torpor, then he cannot know or see. Imagine a bowl of water covered over with slimy moss and water plants. If a man with good eyesight were to look at the reflection of his own face in it, he would not know or see it as it really was. Again, Brahman, when a man dwells with his heart possessed and overwhelmed by worry and flurry, then he cannot know or see. Imagine a bowl of water ruffled by the wind so that the water trembled, eddied and rippled if a man with good eyesight were to look at the reflection of his own face in it, he would not know or see it as it really was. Again, Brahman, when a man dwells with his heart possessed and overwhelmed by doubt and wavering, he cannot know or see. Imagine a bowl of water, agitated, stirred up, muddied, put in a dark place. Doubt is like it, 
put in a dark place. If a man with good eyesight were to look at the reflection of his own face in it, he would not know or see it as it really was. In the same way, Brahman, when a man dwells with his heart possessed and overwhelmed by doubt and wavering, then he cannot know or see as it really is. What is to his own profit, to the profit of others, to the profit of both? Then even sacred words he has long studied are not clear to him, not to mention those he has studied. But Brahman, when a man dwells with his heart not possessed, not overwhelmed by sense desires, ill will, sloth and torpor, worry and flurry, doubt and wavering, then he knows and sees as it really is, what is to his own profit, to the profit of others, to the profit of both himself and others. Then even sacred words he has not long studied are clear to him, not to mention those he has studied. So this is also about memory. Well, you know, when you try to remember things, it's not easy sometimes because mind is full of things, not mindful. You see the difference, mind is full of stuff. So I'll take a couple of minutes to go over this another sutta, Aggi Sutta, the right and wrong times to practice based on the, dip, you know, based on the hindrances. Monks, as the mind is sluggish, that is the wrong time to cultivate the enlightenment factor of tranquility. The enlightenment factor of concentration, samadhi. The enlightenment factor of equanimity. Your mind is sluggish. You, know, you will fall asleep when you try to bring it to stillness, equanimity or tranquility. So you need to see this in your meditation. It's like a man wants to make a small fire blaze if he heaps wet grass, wet cow dung and wet sticks on it. If he exposes it to wind and rain and sprinkles it with dust, can he make that small fire blaze? No, indeed, Venerable Sir, because it's all wet and covered um, with non-fire making stuff. But monks, when the mind is sluggish, that is the right time to cultivate the enlightenment factor of investigation of states. This makes your mind active. The enlightenment factor of energy. The enlightenment factor of rapture. So you bring up more energy. Just remember yesterday, you, we suggested that when you feel sleepy, you can take a walk, a walking meditation and walk backward also unless you want to do just normal walking. <coughs> so um, here, when the mind is sluggish, you do the investigation, you bring up the energy factor, and you bring up more joy to the practice. So uh, when the mind is agitated, that is the wrong time to cultivate the enlightenment factor of investigation of states mm -hmm. or energy or rapture because your mind is already energized agi you know agitated and um, there is no happiness there because agitated mind is hard to come through these factors when the mind is agitated that is the right time to cultivate the enlightenment factors of tranquility, bring it to tranquility, bring it to concentration, bring it to equanimity. So focus on cultivating these other factors of awakening, wholesome factors. So that is from the Agni Sutta. And uh, do you have time for another? Do you have mental energy for another small reading? Okay, so this is Majjhima Nikaya, Middle Length Discourses of the Buddha, Ganaka Moggalla Anasutta, an accountant. I think one of you is an accountant here. Mm -hmm. 
uh, goes to see the Buddha. And uh, so the Buddha explains based on the questions he asked. Um, he mentioned about numbers and so on. You will see that in the beginning of that discourse. But the Buddha focuses on hindrances um, at the end of this discourse and says something so important here. This is about you. After your lunch, you return to your sitting um, and keep your body straight and establish mindfulness in your presence, giving up covetousness for the world. They meditate with the heart rid of covetousness, cleansing the mind of covetousness. This is a clean cleansing process. Giving up ill will and malevolence, they meditate with the mind rid of ill will, full of compassion for all living beings, cleansing the mind of ill will. No, having non-cruelty means having compassion in your heart. Some, if you think that someone is causing suffering to you, think that they are suffering. And it's just something to do with them. Nothing to do with you. You just radiate compassion to them. Just hold them in a spot in your heart, very gently, in a place of compassion. Just give it so generous, generously to them. This is so good to do. When you understand this, you actually stop complaining or trying to correct other people or trying to prove that you are correct. They can be correct and it's okay. <laughs> so liberating. Giving up dullness and drowsiness, they meditate with the mind rid of dullness and drowsiness. Perceiving light. You just don't, you know, darken your windows and put blankets and go hide and sleep. You just like being in the light. And you are mindful and aware, cleansing the mind of dullness and drowsiness. You make this effort continuously to six hour the dullness and come to clarity of your mind. Giving up restlessness and remorse, they meditate without restlessness. Their mind is peaceful inside, cleansing the mind of restlessness and remorse. Giving up doubt, they meditate having gone beyond doubt, not undecided about the meditation or skillful qualities, mindfulness, joy, tranquility, wisdom, cleansing the mind of doubt. And the rest is history. You will, you will move on to opening each, you know, opening those layers of your mind. These are called golden gates sometimes uh, when I describe them. You will open one, inside that golden gate there is another gate with more precious stuff. It's like you are seated under a tree by the lake and you don't move, you don't do any controlling here. You take the controller away. And you will see, the time goes by and you will see birds that you have never seen before come and enjoy the water, but you don't chase them away, you don't control them, you don't tell them what to do. You stay and even more beautiful birds, animals start to come. They don't even notice that you are there. This is how the meditation progresses. And so what are these? golden gates, what are these animals? They give up these five hindrances, corruptions of the heart that weaken wisdom. Then, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, you don't want to please eye, ear, nose, stuff. Secluded from unskillful qualities, the hindrances. They enter you enter and remain in the first jhana, first level of understanding, first layer of this lotus, which has the rapture and bliss born of seclusion, 
what kind of seclusion is this? This is seclusion from all those disturbing hindrances and obstacles. So there is rapture that arises in your mind, joy. Just very stable, very good happiness. While placing the mind and keeping it connected, you, you keep observing the mind, you bring up only the wholesome qualities and you have abandoned the unskillful um, obstructions. There is another layer now. When the mind is stilled, you enter and remain in the second jhana, second layer, second golden gate, which has the rapture and bliss born of stillness. Earlier it was born of seclusion, now this stillness itself brings up a kind of joy, just is springing from within. And I will explain more about this uh, with details, with similes that the Buddha presented to us. They are beautiful. It doesn't stop there. And you have main internal clarity uh, in you and you are staying connected, collected also. And this rapture is the nature of it that it fades away. You are not doing anything to control it, it just fades away. And you enter and remain in the third jhana, third layer, third golden gate. And equanimity comes. Mindful and aware, you experience th the bliss of which the noble ones declare. Equanimous and mindful, you meditate in bliss. It's a kind of bliss that you experience. Rapture disappears, you are not bothered about it, it's just the way it is. And you are just in that level. Enjoying the freedom from this this prison, <laughs> the debts. And the fourth one, giving up pleasure and pain, which you did earlier when you gave up the, with wisdom you gave up the five hindrances and you committed to this twin practice, you already gave up the old ways. So it ends former sadnesses and stuff, any tendencies to toward sadness you are mindful and you don't cultivate that. You don't cultivate sadness, grief here. You enter and remain in the fourth jhana without pleasure or pain. Pleasure and pain, they don't arise in this stage. Just a very, 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 very peaceful state of being. Leveled and calm with pure equanimity and mindfulness. This is called Upekha Sati Parisuddhi. Parisuddhi is purity that is accompanied with mindfulness. You are mindful. Nothing moves there. And there is equanimity. Such a good place to be. So don't build expectations about this. Um, you just create right conditions for the flowers to bloom. You don't have to even ask, you know, where am, I, where am I, which jhana this is, you know. It's just a knowledge. This teaching is for crossing over, not for grasping. The Buddha said, nitaranattaya no gahanattaya, not for grasping. It's like you use a raft to cross over, but you don't carry it. David mentioned this in one of his talks. Um, yeah, you know the story of the the two monks crossing a river, and uh, monks normally don't touch women. <coughs> never, it's one of the rules, um, or men for that matter. Um, so there was this woman trying to cross the river. It was flooded. She was scared. So um, the senior monk held her at, at his back and 
crossed her over and went on. The other monk was very upset for this. So he quietly went to the monastery and he just refused to talk with this monk. And the, the other monk has decided to break the silence and ask, what is the matter? The monks normally maintain silence, you know, they just don't engage in chit chat. They say they, they come together and chat Dhamma. Other times they just, you know, signal and get, you know, do things, bring water and all that. So the, the junior monk said, you are not supposed to touch a woman. You did that. Sorry? Broke the precept. Broke the precept, yeah. It's not a strong precept, it's just a kind of cult, you know, uh, etiquette. <laughs> um, so you just touched a woman, you are not supposed to do that. Although he did a good thing, you know. Um, and the senior monk said, yes, I did. But I dropped her on the other side of the river. It seems like you are still carrying her. <laughs> 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 this can happen. <laughs> can happen. We, you know, we get attached to these incidences and build a story that doesn't even exist. Okay, so um, last thing I want to share is because there was that big storm last night. Um, I, for somehow I think the, the tea I had had caffeine in it and I couldn't, you know, I couldn't just sleep, I wanted to meditate through the storm. Mm -hmm. There was this nice couch and I sat there. Um, it reminded me of two uh, t teachings of the Buddha and I thought I, I like, you know, I, I will share. Uh, Buddha is known also as a poet. He was spontaneous, he came up with words. So uh, this teaching has 17 verses but I only picked just the first two. This is from the Dhaniya Sutta. This is from the Sutta Nipata, 1.2. Sutta Nipata is one of the 15 books of the uh, book collection uh, that are part of the canon, like Dhammapada is. Um, so you will hear when I say it in Pali, there is this man very rich man. He is a son of a very rich, pers ri rich person. He had 30,000 cattle and many lands and he was just happy. Buddha lived um, thousands of miles away but uh, he saw the potential of this man and his wife to be enlightened. That, you know, and the Buddha decided to compassionately uh, help him and uh, a huge storm was approaching um, and the Buddha teleported according to the story teleported there and he heard this man recite um, I will say in English first I have boiled the rice he said that means I have the dinner I have milked the cows With my family and wife, I dwell on the bank of this Mahis river. My hut is thatched. He had a summer palace, that's where he was at. And the fire is fed. Rain, therefore, rain if you wish. So let it rain, and I'm not bothered. So he's quite happy about his worldly life. Um, but the Buddha responds poetically. Uh, in English, these words don't rhyme, but I anyway give you the response, and I will explain how they rhyme. Without anger am I, barrenness gone, the only one night I dwell here on the Mahi's bank. Uncovered is the hut, that is, his mind uncovered, from the hindrances. The fire quenched, 
the fire of lust, hatred and delusion quenched in the Buddha's mind. Rain, therefore, rain if you wish. So this, the person was talking about the worldly stuff and the Buddha talking about his spiritual attainments. So this Dhaniya says, this is the Pali side. Dhaniya uses Pakko Dhano to say, I have boiled the rice. The Buddha says, Akko Dhano to say, I am free from anger. Similar, right? Very, very, yeah, sounds, similar sounds. These are like, um, this is, the, someone has to be very skilled to respond that quickly, spontaneously like that. And Dhaniya says, Duddha Kiro, and the Buddha says, Vigata Kilo. Duddha Kiro means he milks the cows. The Buddha says, Vigata Kilo, the, my mind is free from defilements. Um, and Dhaniya says, Anutire Mahiya Samanavaso. The Buddha says, Anutire Mahiya Ekarattivaso. Very similar sounding. Channa Kuti, he says, my, my roof is covered. The Buddha says, Vivata Kuti, my roof is open. Same, Channa Kuti, Vivata Kuti. Dhaniya says, Ahito Gini, Buddha says, Nibbuto Gini. Dhaniya says, he brought fire, Buddha said, he quenched the fire. And the same line, uh, the Buddha ends with, Atache Pattesi Pavasadeva, Atache Pattesi Pavas Pavasadeva. They both say the same line. If, it, if the rain wants to rain, let it rain. So there's another, um, this is not a discourse. I, I could not find this, actually. Um, <coughs> so I don't remember the details of it. But um, someone comes to the Buddha, and Buddha just ar rose from his meditation. Um, and he was praising something. And the Buddha said, there was this huge storm, and um, I was in cessation. Cessation uh, is a kind of attainment he was in. So he did not sense the storm. He did not sense th that a lightning strikes a, c a cow and got killed near where he was in the, in the open. Um, that's kind of how powerful um, you can develop your mind when you develop in with right instructions. So um, I will try to find it. I'll continue to look for it. But um, that is, that too reminded me of um, the storm. And the, the storm reminded me of these, uh, these pieces from the Buddhist uh, literature and Buddha's teachings. Anyway, I'll stop talking. Um, any questions? Yeah, that is also doubt that you know we tend to c compare with others. You can, s you will see someone sitting longer, and you think, "Oh, I didn't do that. They, you know, uh, I must, I, I must go and sit." So um, it's completely unnecessary to compare because that person may be having a horrible time, although they are just good at sitting. You, your reading of that situation is um, is a false imagination of the mind. All you have to do is to just ground in reality and just accept that you will bring up energy factor and sit. And uh, it was just a thought and you six are it. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Any more questions? Yep. When you were talking about dependent origination, you mentioned states that are pleasant, states that are unpleasant, and states that are neither pleasant nor unpleasant. Is it possible to engage in states that are pleasant without that inherently causing one to experience craving? Or can one approach them mindfully? 
unless you know they are rooted in uh, uh, un uh, unwholesome uh, tendencies in that case you know it, it can be pleasant and pleasant with some unwholesome roots something to do with lust wanting craving uh, when you avoid that uh, there is meditation happiness which is completely harmless and that that pleasure is like joy that is the buddha you know in mahasachata sutta he um, he remembered that when he was a little child he he developed a kind of meditation uh, there was pleasure involved in it and he thought this pleasure has nothing to do with five hindrances or anything unwholesome and there is no need to fear this so he reasoned out with his wisdom that he could choose that kind of pleasure and there's no one blaming him for having that pleasure so um, that is how we need to treat that kind of pleasure so we need to be mindful to make sure that we are not chasing after any worldly pleasures there are pleasures that are born from meditation and you cultivate those and that you will not blame yourself because you are the one asking the biggest questions from yourself at the end of the day um, it's not anyone else we need to have true conscience you know they say true conscience is a soft pillow so you ask yourself is this rooted in wholesome then you cultivate it and if it is rooted in anything unwholesome it disturbs someone it disturbs you it, it disturbs your mental clarity that pleasure you let go when we discuss uh, majjhima nikaya 148 chachakka sutta you will see uh, the underlying tendencies of uh, these pleasures pains and and uh, neutral feelings and come into truth uh, is easy with with that sutta in mind and sister kema had memorized that sutta so if you want to memorize any sutta you can start from that um and it will be very very useful that you you can if you have a long drive home you just uh, memorize it and um meditate with it and go there are many suttas like that but uh, we will discuss that on day 6 yeah any other questions Yeah so six hearing is a practice that you will always keep knowing that these factors of enlightenment uh are coming your way because you are six hearing um, but you won't six hear the enlightenment factors now you can recognize mindfulness you can recognize investigation you can recognize joy you can recognize tranquility you can recognize equanimity and there's no need to six hear them because they are wholesome qualities but i guess i'm asking more like like you describe it as cultivating and if you are cultivating tranquility in response like how does that fit in like how do we cultivate one of those factors in the practice that we're doing yeah um we cultivate it um simply by focusing on it because it's harmless to focus on energy and to notice that you are lacking energy that your mind is dull so uh, that is the time that um, you six hour the dullness but you bring up the smile uh, you keep the smile going and you also let it like soak your heart and there's more fun with the practice now and there's suddenly energy present in you so that will happen So yeah notice um what um, enlightenment factor is present at what you know what situation and this is why we kind of share this wisdom of the buddha 
So it kind of helps you <coughs> to stay on the path and know that you, know, you don't have to have too much knowledge about these things, but um, you know when it is wholesome, you know this is like energy, this is like tranquility. And stay with the spiritual friend and uh, radiate loving kindness, which is a sublime state, divine state, and you continue um, staying with the spiritual friend. These other factors, they develop anyway. That's the way the practice rewards to you. Whether or not you ask them for them, they just, you are rewarded with these qualities. Because you are, you just, you are leaving behind the past, you are letting the future be and you are living here. <coughs> no, you think about the past now, you think about the future now, so all we have is now. You know, just let the <laughs> now be. <laughs> yes. <coughs> So Bhante V always um, said uh, one-pointedness is not uh, uh, concentration, not samadhi. Um, you just, it's like you know, reading and it just can give you a headache because you try to focus, focus, focus and see that tendency in you. There is some craving there. Uh, it has to be more wisdom informed that you are just you know samadhi there's sama is this equal equilibrium and dhi is the buddhi the mind the mind is tranquil and there there is the word concentration i think is a bad translation for samadhi um, some monks use stillness for it Stillness would be a good word. Collectedness also. Yeah. 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 It's like being seated under a tree by that lake and you are just not controlling anything, not focusing on one animal. You're just letting the process be and staying with your spiritual friend and radiating loving kindness. Um, that's all. David. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think Bhante described it as, first of all, you're, you're, there's the feeling of the loving kindness for the spiritual friend. So you want to see that more than trying to visualize. Visualization is 5 to 10%. Gotcha. You simply know that the, it's mostly feeling. And, and, yeah. and then, you, you know, if there's no feeling, Go back to a little bit more. Okay, there he is. And yeah, and smile at him and get that feeling going, and just and let him go back into the background. Thank Don't you. try to make it a seeing something in your mind. Thank you. That's yeah. Cool. Yeah. Some people are. Thank you, David. Some people are good at uh, visualizing things. Some people really don't. Don't do it that well. So we don't have to struggle with it. So, yeah. Yep. Is it helpful during the rectory stage to label um, the hindrance, like go to the side of chasing, or is that more? I think it'll be naturally informed to us. We don't have to make extra effort to label anything. Um, you will sense it. This is frustration, agitation. They, they have different names. This is anxiety, this is depression, and all these little uh, words. Uh, there's some resistance somewhere, and it just, without us knowing, it became this, and you just know it is present. Um, just let it be, allow it to be, and recognize it. Yeah. Yeah. 
you know the rain practice not sit, you know recognize allow um, investigate and uh, non identify so with frustration well i am not introducing anything to six r in you know it's just allowing things is very important because um, when we try to be true too self conscious about any of these things that's uh, that's not the right uh, samadhi that's the wrong samadhi uh, so that's not the right mindfulness that's the wrong mindfulness you see the word right is important here we need to notice the presence of these and let them be and just no need to even label them you can um, for in the beginning but um, but after a while you just get tired of labeling also <laughs> if you go on doing that it's completely um, up to you um in the beginning you may feel like you want to recognize this but actually what you are recognizing is that there is a distraction that's all okay rahul Thank you for that question. It's very important, very very good question. Uh, uh, this also reminds me to complete that story of Dania. <laughs> he, um, I, I told you that Buddha saw his potential, and uh, this storm actually destroyed all his wealth. Um, and by that point, he had heard Buddha's teachings, and his wife and family also had heard Buddha's teachings and the value of going forth. And they chose to become. monks so that option is available for you um, no one is saying no <laughs> can get bhante sachana the next year and ordain you but these are thoughts you know dwelling on these thoughts um is actually waste of energy uh, especially when we are here practicing uh, i i know you know this you know it's just a lot of um, proliferations of what is yet to come there is a very simple story that uh, that will help us here this uh, little kid had a bad experience with a dentist and mom scheduled an appointment a um, couple of months later and this kid started worrying about it so much and he said mommy you don't love me this is why you take me to this dentist <laughs> so he refused to share the bed with mom the day before refused to eat and he was just frozen and he went to the appointment only to find out that that day the appointment is cancelled yeah. so all that worrying is actually it didn't do anything cuz we don't know there's perhaps a reason why we don't know the future it's not known to us future is not us to see we just let it be and just see here the value of the spiritual friendship here and having the teachings having the companion of monks teachers a center and lots of good things the buddha says we need to practice like our head is on fire this is very very uh, important because um 
last night when all the lightning was happening it could have been my last moment I was walking in the uh, forest I mean t into the forest and um, use fortunately we don't have bears you know it could be my last moment a tree can collapse and have no time to <coughs> call David he's my 911 and every time a vicious dog comes you know I would call him and come rescue me so you know things happen so we don't know uh, there's no ending this is a dead end to think now, I am one of these people I you know I also do this we all do this we think 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 we have many what ifs, um, but see the positive side of it that you want to do something good with this life and something you want to do better. So take it positively, use that energy to be productive and also find santutti, content heart with what you do. You are content with what you have. Uh, you are thankful for what you have and uh, you notice that people who had in abundance also, this is important, uh, they succumbed to death. They died. They left behind everything. And they died. Um, this is not a negative view. This is just reflecting on truth. Uh, so monks usually do maranānusati, um, reflecting on death monks do asubhanusati, reflecting on asubha, that is non-beauty of the body. It helps them to cut down the attachment stuff. They reflect on the Buddha, how he abandoned all these things that we are trying to achieve, the three palaces, all the beautiful women he was given and potential to be the universal monarch. He, he was trained for that. Um, so we reflect on Buddha's nine qualities, how he is, how he became the Buddha, how he became the teacher for heavens and humans, how he became someone who could tame any untamable person. So we reflect on these qualities, the nine qualities of the Buddha. Um, and we do the Kaya Gata Sati, reflecting on uh, the body's true nature, decaying nature. So um, so when we do that, there is this urgency for us to stay on the right track, thinking that this may be my last moment. And then we know that even something, some harm come our way, because we took this moment seriously, we are in a good place. Because last thought decides where you are born in next lifetime. It's not how much we had or how good we planned our future. Um, look, Steve Jobs, he developed Apple and he, de he also had cancer and unfortunately he could not live that empire he built. Um, he only enjoyed it so much. So this is not to infuse a negative view to the mind. This is to see that things happen like that. What we need to focus on is just what is important now? How can I prioritize my mental peace, mental health, mental well-being, contentment, um, spiritual wealth, not the material wealth? So Dhania was happy with this material wealth. Buddha was happy with the spiritual wealth. So good? Okay. Yeah. No. Um, it can be an animal. I, I, so it's best we, we take a human friend for a spiritual friend. Um, Non-humans look more, actually, more human-like sometimes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I see that. Uh, but with this practice, um, you include non-humans in your loving-kindness, obviously. I tried to cultivate that kind of mind with all of you this morning based on Buddha's words on loving-kindness. 
uh, we know that um, we look each uh, innocent being as my child and that that mind um, but take a human to to cultivate because sometimes say you radiate loving kindness to um, outside of retreat you radiate loving kindness to your mom she feels it suddenly she calls you and she says you know five hours ago i felt you strongly in my heart were you thinking of me and you say yes mom i was radiating loving kindness to you so this is the thing this is like telepathy this works when your mind is doing these developments mind's domain triggers things in the area in the world like they say the fruits ripen uh, nicely and sweetly so things like that you know it's just something that we cannot describe always but mind is very powerful um, we don't live in houses or monasteries we live in the mind which is an unlimited area um, we build these memory walls here and there we have to destroy them to see the freedom <laughs> and inside this mind home there can be anger boiling in the kitchen of this mind and past worries tucked under the rugs of this mind so this is why we do cleansing and for that um, we need to see the human mind as a powerful tool that we connect with and radiate loving kindness to it is completely um, harm harmless okay yeah yeah Yeah. To help yeah. That Very good. Thank you. Yeah, composure. Is, this is the Pali word ekagata. This is like composure. Uh, is a good. Yeah, he picked a, the right word. And thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, composure. You will feel that in the meditation practice. Yeah. More questions? Okay. Um, I think at one point you said something like, like we're not like cultivating through fear, but I'm wondering like, what the advice is when like if feelings like that come up like in the context of like forgiveness meditation? We are not what earlier. What did you oh, say? Oh, that was so sorry. Yeah. So I think at one point earlier when you were talking about the jhanas, like you, you said something like like we're not trying to cultivate like grief here. Hmm. No, it's very, very good question. Uh, um, grief is the measure of your love towards someone, especially someone who said goodbye to us. We grow around it uh, and we do good things like feeding birds and say, Mommy, I'm feeding birds for you today. It's just a way to celebrate life of that person. You can grieve a person who's alive, but you don't have any access to this person. So when these strong feelings arise, um, you forgive yourself first by not, you know, for not understanding the whole of it and that it, it is present now. It's nothing bad. It's just a human experience. And uh, let it be, allow it to be. Uh, use Siksari, recognize, release, relax, return to your spiritual friend, or return to forgiveness. Um, and uh, they are there, they are showing where our heart is, and it takes time and energy and effort and change of many practices, many habits to develop um, a different mindset, and we patiently wait for that to happen doing what is right now because now is all that we have so we treat grief as a visitor that is visiting now and let it be we don't serve any tea to it we just let it be and uh, move on with 
there's the you know whatever the object of meditation you are cultivating you move on with it we all feel grief at different times and pet loss grief and grief of losing a friend and lots of that so but please don't blame yourself for anything or build a story about it um, it's completely unnecessary to do that okay yeah Yeah, that's something Bhante suggested actually. Um, like your graduation, the day you had your first child or something. So please continue. Um, done asking the question? Yeah, yeah so yeah. No, yeah. Kind of a way to it's this is, this is, yeah. <laughs> yes. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's like looking at flowers. Your mind is beautiful. That is why you are seeing things that are beautiful out there, and it's completely harmless. If you created an image out of this to in a shape of a girl or something, this is getting toward unwholesome side with loving kindness you start to see beauty of even the ugly things there is a discourse called Halidva, uh, Metta Sahagata Sutta it's also called Halidvasana Sutta um, Sanyutta Nikaya um, 1606 page number there the Buddha describes how your mind gets to just see the beauty in the ugliest things out there in the world so the Sun um, it's a beautiful thing, it's completely um, harmless and yes, please um, just absorb into it. Um, there is a, this reminds me of a story. <laughs> um, so th there was this monk and he has a habit of taking a walk to see the sunset. And he allows one of his students to walk with him, but the rule is he cannot talk. But there was this day a new student monk was allowed to walk with him and as soon as he saw the sunset he said, what a beautiful sunset. So he broke the rule. So the teacher stopped the walk and went back to the monastery and said, this student is never allowed to walk with me again. <laughs> and other students said, why, what's the problem? He's just new and allow him to walk. And the teacher said, when my student said, what a beautiful sunset, he was looking at the words, not the actual beauty of the sunset. We ruin the beauty by ha building a story about it. It's okay to have some story, but not over, like, yeah, meditation, happiness, of course, but also there are these, there is the nature, tr beautiful trees. These are not sparking lust, hatred, and delusion, not sparking any, any hindrance in us. So they are completely harmless. We can't live in the world like that otherwise. Yeah? Could I add one <laughs> yes, one? please. Mm -hmm. We call him Sukha because he's happy. Or 
Mm. And he'll just jump up on you, right on your chest. And you just hold him and just feel that loving kindness. That's loving kindness. Yep. And just practice. Mm -hmm. Just feel it. And get a recharge. Yep. That's it. You know? Yep. Just feel it. He's like a big baby. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Baby, he just loves you. Yeah. So basically you're saying to just, sorry, a little bit of um, to observe whatever arises in your meditation or you see beauty in the world or observe it with as much clarity as possible and composure as possible, not overanalyze it or anything like that. Just step back and... Analyzing is not necessary. Unless you know how to analyze, actually. You will learn it in this retreat. So with those tools, your analyzing will be very different. Um, so it's not like <coughs> analyzing in the regular analyzing way. It's just to see the truth as is. Truth as it arises and vanishes. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But every time I go to, to regenerate myself, sometimes it just comes. But a lot of times, even if it arises alongside it, it's just this like sensations that mm. can be quite painful. And I sick a lot of them, but it almost feels like the painful sensations mm. make it hard to even like feel some of the metta sometimes. Mm. It's a good idea to switch to forgiveness. Um, there's a booklet uh, here um, by Bhante, and we can give a copy to you. It's right in the interview room. Um, so that way you kind of pause this practice a little bit and do some forgiveness practice and come back to the practice again. Um, sometimes the body is perhaps demanding compassion. Maybe loving kindness is not what the body needs. So forgiveness will be very uh, meaningful to to deal with it. We will see. Okay. Yeah. Just to follow up on that question. Hmm? What I would say is that, the, that you have the intention uh, is important, that although you don't strongly feel uh, that those feelings of loving kindness, you, uh, your intention is there. And you are uh, not steering f f too far away from that intention of radiating loving kindness and cultivating thoughts. Sometimes feelings are not strongly felt like that, but your intention works, and you know that. Um, that is perhaps the answer to this. David, do you want to add anything? Well, I would say that you, you want to be careful about trying to establish metta like 100% of the time. Mm. It's just not going to happen. Mm. You just kind of gently nudge it along, and then you might feel a little warmth. Mm. And just be with that. Mm. It. Don't try to make it bigger. It doesn't have mm. to be big. And when it gets a little weak, you bring up mm. sukha again. Yeah. Let, let's not think, well, that's it. It's yeah. not working. It's okay. <laughs> and I don't want to go stay in the woods. Yeah. <laughs> well, without a pedicure in the first time. <laughs> well, uh, I think the sukha therapy works, will work for you. <laughs> uh, it's freely available here. Yeah. 
and has very many hours of doing that into his <laughs> life. The black and white, yeah. Orange. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Puddle, Puddles has evolved actually to be like Sukha like now. Yeah. It, he used to be more active and running, but now he's, I think, he's getting the kind of loving kindness you all are, uh, have given him. Um, so this reminds me of a monk uh, who broke a precept and he was not feeling loving kindness. So he was punished. The punishment he was given is to give 50 strokes to the cat of the monastery. <laughs> so that will kind of bring back the loving kindness. So. And I think your response kind of confused me where you said like it's the intention that matters, but like if the feeling of metta is supposed to be the object of concentration and you're not feeling it, but you like do have the intention, but then like what, what becomes the object? Well, feeling is not always strongly felt, but your mind is keeping attention on loving kindness all the time. And you know you are not distracted from that goal. And that way, um, when the feeling arises, whether it is 5% or, because we can't always look for that feeling and say, oh, I don't have that feeling. So you don't, there's no way you can let, you know, force a feeling to be. So this is when we know we are on loving kindness and I'm radiating loving kindness to my spiritual friend and I'm progressing and uh, not occupied with things that m makes my mind busy. And uh, we will share more um, steps um, maybe in the interviews tomorrow. Uh, how loving kindness uh, changes to compassion and all that. Okay, please just, you know, it's the first day, like David said, and it's only the first day. And um, so basically, you don't want to let your mind convince you that you failed. No, exactly. Yeah, you, it's six easy. That. Yeah, six are that. <laughs> mind will want to convince you that you, you know, that's the way that we um, habitually. Um, used to mind minds doings, but now we give a different mode of way uh, living f to the for this mind. Okay. Oh, more questions? Yeah. And I appreciate your persistent energy and effort also, which are uh, factors of eightfold path. And um, well, this pain could be a result of some injury you had and the body um, is trying to get used to your sitting. So if you can switch to some walking and maybe break your sitting to um, shorter sittings and also change the way you sit, um, sit in a chair mm, with a cushion, with more support and see how the sitting experience changes. And if you have to use painkillers uh, and mindfulness is not working enough like a painkiller, um, please use that. I think that will be beneficial. If, if you had an injury and that it is, you know, coming up and bothering. Um, but if not, um, 
um, too much effort, uh, please notice if that is happening. Um, like that, that may be a little wanting and controlling happening there. Um, if that happens, step back and uh, resort to just radiating loving kindness to yourself and to the spiritual friend. Yeah, radiate loving kindness to the pain itself. Anything else you want to add to it? What what is this pain? Um, I think it's for me like a, uh, in this afternoon a lot was just like in my shoulders. I think more from you know instead of do, doing this instead of doing oh, this all day. Okay, okay, okay. Uh -huh. so you're kind of straightening up now. Yeah, how, exactly. How, how long are you sitting? Um, thirty to sixty minutes. <coughs> And that just spirals right down. As, as Bhakti said, you, you want to shift position, take a walk, mm -hmm. but you're not sitting very long. So, uh, yeah, you want to get comfortable like that. Mm -hmm. And then once you're comfortable, don't move and just let it be. Six are any reaction to that pain. Mm -hmm. But yeah, don't fight with it. Some monks uh, only work on their sitting posture for about a year and then they do the meditation. Um, so it's a process with so much patience and waiting. Yeah. You'll be doing good. Yeah. Just give a nice tap on your shoulder. So. <laughs> Okay, perhaps that is the L uh, you have. Yeah. Maybe quick question. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if, if this is a question about the precepts and if this is something that breaks it, but you know, we have an hour of free time and I was wondering, does making mandala break the precept of like no dancing or singing or, yeah, just a um, It's not breaking precepts. It's just that, see, the, the, that activity that you want to do, if, uh, if you still can stay with your object of meditation, mm -hmm. um, that's a good distraction to have. And that's like your cell phone um, in the retreat, mandala cell phone. But <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> if it's distracting you and taking too much time and you take too much interest in it, <clears throat> Please observe that and six out the mandala and uh, switch to sitting right there. So, yeah. Good. Oh, <laughs> another hand up. <laughs> Wondering, yeah. Prop up really high and get the pressure off here. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Not a question, but a comment as well. Like, one thing I've observed to bring up loving kindness and help for me, if anything else, is like to be sort of happy. So, one thing that helps is gratitude. So, right. yesterday I was sitting here thinking, I'm like, hey, I'm so well taken care of here, and I have mm -hmm. the opportunity to come here and stuff, and I felt very grateful. And that made it a lot easier to come out here. Mm. Looking at the brighter side. Yeah. Grass is not greener on the other side. Shall we share merits? Okay. Please join your palms together and we recite together. May suffering ones be suffering free and fear struck fearless be. May grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay.
happy meditation